On today's show, we're reacting to day two of the NBA draft. Did the next Nikola Jokic or Jalen Brunson just get picked in the second round today? Plus, Bronny James to the Lakers, KCP opts out, and Kristaps Porzingis gets surgery. All of that and more on today's Locked On NBA. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On NBA Friday. Wes Goldberg here with Adam Mates. However, you're tuning in on YouTube, Odyssey, or your favorite podcast app. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Before we get to the Lakers doing the thing we all knew they were going to do, take Bronny James to pair him up with his dad, LeBron James. Before we get to some big free agency news. And some big news out of Boston regarding Kristaps Porzingis, who may not be ready to begin next season. We just wrapped up day two of the NBA draft, Adam. And as you know, better than anybody, the second day of the draft, well, it's the first time we did the second day of the draft. The second <laughs> right. round of the draft is nothing to sleep on because you might just get a multiple time MVP while a Taco Bell commercial is airing, as the Denver Nuggets did when they selected Nikola Jokic in the uh, second round of the NBA draft. We've had a lot of a lot of good second rounders lately. Yeah. Jalen Brunson was a second round pick. We all remember like Draymond Green way back. Um, even maybe not like superstar all star guys, but Andrew Nemhard recently, our guy Herb Jones recently, also a second round pick. So when you look at the second round picks today, is there a guy that you think was picked that has that kind of star potential in the second round? No, but that, I mean, that's not really saying much. It's like, do you think you have the winning lottery ticket? I don't think so. But, um, you know, there are some players that I like. If you were to ask me for candidates, I would start here. And it's going to sound crazy. When you're trying to pick somebody to be this, not just a good player and stick, but oh my God, they're a star. You have to go with somebody with like a mysterious background. You know, Jalen Wells would be that guy to me. He went 39th. He goes, I believe, to the Memphis Grizzlies. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Was he? Yeah. 39th. He is a guy that was playing at Sonoma state for a couple of years, was not highly recruited out of college or any of this ended up playing one year at Washington state and had a breakout year. Great shooter. So he can score like to be a star. You're going to have to be a scorer. Great shooter. Like really, really good shooter. Almost reminds me of cam Johnson a little bit in the release mm. and in the height body type, all of those things. So he has one elite skill. And anytime there's a guy who like three years ago was a 5'10 JV player and all of a sudden now he's in the NBA, you go, hey, that's a steep curve. Maybe that continues. I like that he's 6'7". I like that he's a late bloomer. Uh, I like that he's an, uh, uh, an improving outside shooter. He shot 42% on his three-pointers last year. When you combine size and shooting with a little bit of that ball handling, you know, I, I think that there's something there and uh and memphis has done really well in the second round right they've or in the draft in general like they usually go for these guys who test out well in their analytic models and all these things and they tend to draft well so picking one of the grizzlies guys is good and that's sort of what i'm looking at here too is where are the places that i think guys will be developed properly right like what's a good situation i like tyler smith from the g league ignite i hate that he got drafted to the milwaukee bucks because that's the place where rookies go to die Right? Yeah. They have not had a good rookie since Giannis. And so... Um, Dante and Gian- DiVincenzo was good. I am so sorry. My apologies to Dante DiVincenzo. <laughs> That's one, but it is one. You're right. <laughs> and they let him go. So um, I'm looking at some of the, the the places here. Kyle Filipowski with the 32nd pick. I don't think he has star potential, but I like the fit there in Utah. They do well with their young guys, right? They kind of resuscitated a guy even like Colin Sexton, who was a lottery pick. They helped resuscitate his career because they have the right approach with these young guys. So I like that. The Jonathan Mogbo thing with the first pick of the draft in the second round, Toronto trades for that pick. They get I it. Like this guy. They, I like him a lot. He's six, six, but has like that really long wingspan. He's got that weird body, almost like a Draymond green body Love type it. there. Love it. Um, he needs to get stronger, but the dude is a grinder. Yeah. It just, he, he's, he's a great lob threat, big time athlete. Good slasher, good rebounder, kind of rebounds. You know, you talk about catch radius in the NFL. He's got like a really long rebounding radius in the NBA. It just feels like he's going to do stuff, right? It just feels yeah. like he ends up being 
if not like a starting center, just a rotation center for a really long time and a coach's kind of favorite player for a long time. I love this guy. And, and like Wells, they have a similar backstory. He played at two junior colleges, you know, very recently was a 5'10 guy, guard, and all of a sudden he grew into be the 6'6", six, six, just absolute unit. And so he's a guy I like. Grab 14 rebounds, a, I, I believe 14 rebounds a game in college. So he's a guy who can really grab some boards. He hustles. He plays hard. He's a pick, but he was the 31st pick. So that's almost a technicality. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Really in um, the round. I got one more name for you then. Okay. This is my, this might be my favorite guy in the second round. He was one of the hashtag my guys in the okay. draft. Harrison Ingram out of North Carolina. Okay. Six, five with a seven foot wingspan. Adam, I'm thinking about our guy. I'm thinking about our guy, Herb Jones. Wow. Wow. You're pulling the Herb Jones card? <laughs> pulling the, the Herb card here. Uh, they don't play the same. You know, Harrison Ingram is definitely more of like a power forward, while Herb Jones, he could guard all five positions. But I think if yeah. you had to put him at a spot, it would be more perimeter-oriented. But in terms of just finding a hard-nosed, gritty defender in the second round, the way the Pelicans did Herb Jones, I feel like the Spurs might have just done that with Harrison Ingram. I love this pick for them. Super long. He's got versatility to his game like you look at him and you're like he's probably just a three and d he has the body type and everything of like those three and d guys who are more d than three but he shot it pretty well from three point range 39 percent last season but he also averaged like four or five assists for north carolina last year he was used on the ball quite a bit i i like that he went through that experience he wasn't awesome at it but i like that he at least has that ability to bounce the ball when he gets to the nba level but he's going to be able to walk in right away and just, I think, guard three different positions, maybe four. And uh, and hmm. and I like the 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 interview he gave to Malika Andrews on ESPN. Big time chess player, learned how to play oh chess God. when he was seven years old. Okay, I can't. You're doing the thing. This is what Wes. You are doing what NBA teams do. They're like, I didn't like the guy, but we had him in for a workout. Very. You know, Greg Popovich interview. loves it. You know, yeah, very impressive wait, did you interview. say seven? You were seven when you learned to play chess? If it was yeah. 11, I'd have a problem. But seven? Oh, man. Is this the next Queen's Gambit on our hands? Like, we, exactly it. we got a savant over here. He said he, uh, play, he, he, he plays basketball like he, like he strategizes chess. I'm in. I'm in. Well, there you go. The last guy I have for you that I actually like goes to the Knicks, A.J. Mitchell. Like he's him. a guy kind of reminds me of Nemhard, which is mm -hmm. really in control, even though he's not fast, has a variety of floaters and just like finishes around the rim. Super feel for the game, in my opinion. Great passer, sees a lot of angles. I think he's a good player. He's not that athletic. I don't know if the Knicks were the right spot for him, but, you know, who knows? He's a, he's a good player. I don't know if he'll get on the court there, but um, I like him and I could see him being a guy that sticks around. I like the addition there because Miles he's a little bit bigger than Miles McBride. Miles McBride a little undersized at that spot. He had a good year last year after they traded uh, quickly and those guys away, but maybe a little insurance there. So I like the pick. But they also, didn't they get Tyler Kolek? Or no, he went to, where did he end he up? He went to Portland. He went to Portland. He, he's in Portland. Okay, I like that for them. Um, my last name, Cam Spencer out of UConn, uh, goes 53 overall to the Detroit Pistons. The Pistons heard you. Right, they take Ron Holland at number five, and everybody's like, "Well, you don't That's have right. any shooting." They said, "Don't worry about it. We'll handle all of our shooting problems with the fifty-third pick in the draft." There Cam he Spencer, is. I joke, but he might be the best shooter in the draft. Shoot on the move, lights out. I think he could be the Sam Merrill of this draft, where he's just taken really late and he just walks in and he's like, "You know what? I have one job and I can do it really well, and I'm not going to do anything else for you. Don't expect me to do anything else for you, but I can hit some open threes. Uh, What's the funny Pistons are going to have that, to address their shooting outside of Cam Spencer, but at least they did something. What's funny about that is, I mean, not necessarily the Pistons situation, but if a second round pick, if you told me he had two good years, you'd be like, well, that's great. It's a second round pick. Yeah. Usually they have zero good years. So if you told right. me he was good for one or two years, it's like, well, you already got value out of what, what you should expect there. All right. So we talked about, I don't know, half a dozen second rounders. The odds that we're right about which one is going to be the next star <laughs> is yeah. slim to none. And that's how it works. Um, that said, we did have another big second round headline, at least second round pick happen when the Lakers took Bronny James. We'll talk about what we can expect from Bronny in Los Angeles, plus some free agent news coming out of Denver and the Celtics could be without Kristaps Porzingis to start next season. We'll talk about all of that next on Locked on NBA.
Today's episode of Locked On NBA is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. They have all in pricing. All you have to do is toggle on this feature when you're on the Game Time app, and it shows the total up front with no surprise fees at checkout. Plus, Get a panoramic view from your seat with seat views in the app before you buy. The lowest price guarantee on Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference if you find a lower price somewhere else. Plus, Game Time ticket coverage, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code LOCKEDONNBA, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A, for twenty dollars off, download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. The best way to support us is to subscribe on YouTube. Also, follow us on your favorite podcast app. Leave a comment under our YouTube video here. Let us know who you think the next Jalen Brunson slash Nikola Jokic might be in the second round. We got a fun countdown coming up later in the show, but let's start here. The Lakers took Bronny James at the 55th pick in the draft. We all expected it. Everybody saw this coming. Bob Myers on ESPN saying that uh, they were actually, uh, Rich Paul and them were actually calling teams, telling them not to take Bronny James because he wouldn't show up for them. Oh Um, yeah, that's that's awesome. We have a cool league here we cover. Well, all right, before we get to, you know, Bronny and the Lakers, that is so ridiculous. I don't, I, I, not because it happened. And I don't, I'm not saying it didn't happen because Bob Myers obviously is very connected to that whole world. Previously, he was an agent, previously, he was a general manager. He's got connections all over that world. I don't know how many teams were banging down the door to try to draft Bronny James. This guy, I don't think, was really considered a serious draft prospect, even in the second round when you talk to draft people. I, I just find that hard to believe that. Rich Paul spent the entire day calling up teams, threatening them to not take their, maybe it happened once or twice, right? Or maybe he was getting in front of it, but I don't know that there was a lot of teams out there trying to get their hands on Bronny when it looked like there was a lot of pretty good um, prospects left in the second round. I think it's just that, I mean, look, this happens, um, we're calling this out, but this is really how the NBA works. There's guys, they start working out. It did work out. So if somebody said they want me, I'm not working out anymore. Don't draft me. I already, I'm going to the spot I want. So it's not like this is unique, but I will say with the Bronny one, it was for years now, like two years, Wes, we've been talking about this. LeBron will go wherever, you know, his his kid goes and then backed off of that a little bit. And then it's like, yeah, but if anybody else takes him, we'll sabotage it. We'll ruin your <laughs> life. We will kidnap your children and not return them until unless you don't draft. Ronnie. It's like it was just a little bit over the top. And here's all yeah. I'll say about it. I think this is awesome. This is a great story yes. when a father and son get to play together. But to me, it doesn't feel like it because like for me personally, this is my experience with LeBron and I love LeBron as a player. I've loved him for a long time. Everything always like the wind is always out of the sail on everything with this because it's been a two year buildup because it feels a little weird and how it gets manipulated to it that by the time it arrives, I'm like numb to the actual coolness of it. Right. And that's just right. how I feel. I'm with you. Uh, we're going to focus too much on the politics of this and how the sort of the process of how it happened and not the fact that this is the first father son duo in NBA history and that LeBron and that this clearly means a lot for LeBron James. And I think that part is really cool. Um, but the, cool. The, the truth is this kind of politicking happens all the time behind the scenes in the NBA. You know this. This is just it's so out there. It's been so public because of the names and the, and the stature of the people that are involved in this. That it just does, I think, feel a little icky mm-hmm. for a lot of people that just are sort of ca- more casual observers for the rest of the league. I would understand where, you know, there's there's um, uh, claims of nepotism and all these kinds of things. It, this happens, man. This happens. The second round is full of politics, right? You either you have players that are not going to sign contracts, threaten not to sign two ways, and so don't even draft me and all these things. Like, this is all happening behind the scenes. The second round, the first round is basically a meritocracy where it's like, okay, the best players essentially will go in that order. But the second round is just sort of like a, it's very different than that. It's much more scattershot as we know, but um, the Lakers get their guy. They, they manipulated the second round where they needed to do it. Realistic expectations for Bronny with the Lakers as a rookie or just in general. Um, no, <laughs> do I have, it's like, do I have any? Not really. Um, 
you know, he'll get an opportunity to play with LeBron. I imagine that it really will help him. Like, if you think about this just for Bronny, I imagine being there will actually really help him out. Talk about a mentor. Um, mm. You know, talk about opportunity and all those different things. So for him, if you just isolate, what does this mean for him? I think it means something great. But my expectations are that he's a very young player with a lot to a lot of headway to kind of grow into the player he can be and hasn't played a ton in the last year and a half, um, obviously because of the heart thing. And, and so I just I think slow process is what you should probably expect here. I kind of worry about this from LeBron's point of view, and I'm sure he's given this more thought than I have, but. Now you have to kind of be the father on the team. This is a team that is supposedly seriously trying to contend in the Western Conference next year. Mm -hmm. And is LeBron basically going to be Bronny's coach? Because how do you not feel that way if you're the father, right? Like it's, yeah, J.J. Redick is the coach of the team and they'll have assistant coaches and development guys and all these kinds of things. But if you're Bron if you're LeBron, you're going to have obviously that sense of responsibility over Bronny. I don't think that he's going to feel like Bronny's got to be playing but there's going to be a moment where they, where they finally get to share the court together and it's going to be awesome but i don't know that those are ever going to become those are ever going to come in important moments of any basketball game because this team is trying to win games right this team is actively right. trying to take a step in the next direction and so i'm a little i'm just sort of interested in that whole dynamic of how much responsibility does lebron take over bronny within the context of the team outside of just being his dad how can he almost separate those two things because i don't think that there's any doubt like, Bronny's not helping this team win games. I don't think anybody right. thinks that he is. Uh, and I don't think that those are, those are the expectations. Now, can he one day, three, four years from now, be a helpful player? I guess this is, like you said, maybe the best spot for him to try to become that. Let's move on, though. Um, <laughs> to your team, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, reportedly declining one, his player option. He's going to be one of the most sought-after free agents this summer. Let's start with your team, though. What does this mean for Denver? Well, to me, this means a lot. I have a hard time imagining Denver being as good next season as they have been for the last two without KCP. He's a very specific type of three and D player that they need while they have defensive replacements for him, namely Christian Brown, who's a bigger defender and guards players like say Anthony Edwards significantly better than KCP did. Mm. KCP guards guys like Steph Curry better and, you know, Damian Lillard and the type of guards, Devin Booker, those types of players, he guards them better. He gets around screens. Um, and more importantly, he completed one of the best five man lineups in the NBA over the last two years. He was a perfect fit for that specific lineup. So for me, Denver losing him would be a pretty big loss, one that I think would knock them down a peg. Where right now, this year and obviously last year, Denver was in the top tier of contenders, in my opinion. The these are the favorites. If they lost KCP. I think at best you would look at them and say, I think they're now in that second tier. The mm -hmm. could win it, you know, have a great chance at winning it. They're also, but they're not the favorites. They're not in the top tier. So that represents a pretty big margin for Denver. Um, and I'm worried that they'll lose him. Would you put a percent chance on it? 90. That is uh, and, and in part because, and I don't know if you saw this, Wes, but in the press, uh, in it, when Calvin Booth addressed the media yesterday uh, to introduce Daron Holmes and talk about, you know, their draft pick, he was asked about KCP and he somewhat, I don't want to say coldly, but very like uh, untactfully, matter of, factly, yeah. matter of factly and untactfully said, hey, sometimes teams have to lose a player like KCP. Lots of good teams lose a player like him and they're fine. And it was just one of those things that felt more like resignation, like, mm -hmm. hey, that's already happening. Just kind of get ready for it. And it's fine, which I think is his true perspective, but also indicates that they're probably not so hung up on the idea that he might not be back. I understand where Booth is coming from in his general sort of theory on this this era with Nikola Jokic is, look, we don't necessarily have to repeat. He obviously gave that 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 comment to Kevin O'Connor at the Ringer last year before the right. season started about, we're not necessarily looking to repeat. We're just trying to win multiple titles during the decade, kind of like the Spurs and all these things. And so far, mission accomplished, right? <laughs> he didn't <laughs> okay. repeat. But... Uh, there is a talent drain happening there, right? You've got Bruce Brown leaving last year. Contavious Caldwell Pope, 90% chance he leaves this year. Yeah. Christian Brown was a nice find. I, I do still like some of the young guys that they brought in over the last couple of years outside of him. I love Deron Holmes the second. I love that pick of them, too. but he's not helping replace Brown and KCP on the perimeter. He's just sort right. of giving him giving the Nuggets something that they haven't had over the last few years uh, in the front court. But these guys have to develop. Like Some of these guys really need to start developing or 
it's not going to be okay to just keep letting these guys walk. Now, I guess the other part of this is, well, nobody else is walking anytime soon. It's it was kind of Bruce Brown and KCP. They're gonna. It looks like they're gonna get to an extension with Jabal Murray here. This is sort of the team, and now they have an opportunity to develop the team around those four guys with Jokic, Murray, Aaron Gordon, and MPJ. But they they need some of these guys to pop, some of these young guys to pop for the strategy really to work, or else they need to go out and and make some trade. They are they, what they also traded Reggie Jackson to Charlotte for a handful of second round picks. So so here's the story with Denver is that they. You know, Michael Malone did not play the young guys that Calvin Booth believed should play last year, including Jalen Pickett, who's a point guard, who mm -hmm. Calvin Booth coming into the year thought would take the reins. And, OK, that's our backup guy. We're going to spend a year getting him ready. And in a year's time, he'll be ready. Reggie Jackson played all 82 games last year. Oldest member on the team did not miss a game. That means Pickett did never played. And so now you go into it. And I really think Calvin Booth said, fine, that was supposed to be the training wheels. That was the safety net. I'm taking away the safety net. The right. Denver Nuggets, who have title aspirations now, might lose KCP and will go into next year with a point guard who has not played in the NBA yet as their only choice at backup. And that has to do, again, with Calvin Booth's belief and Michael Malone's lack of belief in that plan. And I think that's really the story around the Denver Nuggets. It's fascinating, right? You're you're basically forcing Michael Malone out of his comfort zone, in a sense, to do something he doesn't want to do with the rotation. and. I guess Booth got his way. He's in charge of the roster. I guess he could do that. Um, all right. We'll talk about the defending champs. Did the Celtics just take a hit in their opportunity to maybe repeat next season? We'll talk about that next year on Locked on NBA. Today's episode of Locked on NBA is brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whatever you're into, whether it's speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusion supply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Before we count down to the weekend, the Celtics announced that Christoph Porzingis had surgery to repair his leg injury that sidelined him for most of the finals, and that he's going to return to play in five to six months, meaning he's going to be out well into the start of next season. This is We're looking at late December, January return here for Christoph Porzingis. What do you think this means for the Celtics? I mean, obviously it hurts. You go into a title defense season, those are hard anyway because you played all the way to June. Mm -hmm. um, you have a shortened off season to begin with, and now you're going to be short one guy and they're a top heavy team to begin with. So I think it's a challenge, but here's the thing. They won 64 games last year. They have a lot of margin with the roster that they have. So, well, I think it will affect their season. It might even affect the race for the number one seed. Mm -hmm. I think it ultimately will not affect their title odds too dramatically. They already did the thing where they got the one seed best record in the league, cruised to a champion, cruised to the finals, won the championship. They did that thing. Very yeah. rarely, even with champ like like repeat champions, you saw this with 2012 to the 2013 Heat, the Warriors yeah. going from 2017 to 2018. You kind of just do it once, and then you say, "All right, we'll take our pedal, we'll take our foot off the pedal a little bit. We know what we can do. We've got proof of concept. Let's just get to the playoffs as a decent seed, and and we'll go from there." So they were probably already heading in this direction anyway, but this does it, it's just a little shaky, and you could argue, and I and. Celtics fans might like roll their eyes at this. Last year might have been the best pick case scenario for Christoph Porzingis, given that he was relatively healthy for the regular season, never really suffered a major injury, was able to return. Yes, he le he left in the first round of the playoffs, but they never needed him for the playoffs, and then comes back fresh for the NBA Finals and then gets hurt again. But that might be the best case scenario for a guy with his injury history. You know, <laughs> yes. you know what? I love this. You got galaxy brained on me. You might be right. <laughs> there is something to this. Like, right? yeah, it's a half season. Basically, that's all. That's all it is. That's perfect. You know what? You sold me. <laughs> so the odds of that happening two years in a row were already slim. I do think that you, you got Al Horford getting up there in age, but he's still under contract. Xavier Tillman, I believe, is a free agent. They need to add I mean, depth. To, they need to yeah. add depth to the position regardless. And, and that's probably their priority this offseason. And that. That, by the way, is their only priority. Everything else is good. 
just yeah. grab maybe a couple of centers on the minimum to, to eat up some minutes, eat up innings in the regular season, and then just try to make sure Porzingis is as healthy as he can be for the playoff run. All right. Come, come back mid January. You, you ramp up till the all-star break. And then by the all-star break, you hit the ground running. It's really like a four month season. Then the post, I mean, that's, I like it, man. You talked me into this. <laughs> it's Friday, which means it's time to count down to the weekend with our weekly powering a system player. I am a system player. Go power rankings. Go power rankings. The NBA draft is over. What's our countdown? Today we are looking at the best names. You know I love a good names draft. Best names in the 2024 NBA draft. Let's do it. First, we have an honorable mention. And you're going to say why. I'm going to go with Reed Shepard. Reed Shepard. Now, why is this a good name? It lends itself to so many good basketball puns and basket you know that was a great read like reading the game he's shepherding the team to victory there's so that's many a different point. headlines and he plays the right, right position head. yep yep that's 100 percent right i love reed shepherd because he feels like a player from the 1960s era of the <laughs> nba where everybody was plumbers and firemen what was it that okay JJ yeah. like I mean, he has a 40 inch vertical but yeah yeah, he's like he. Yeah, he's the most athletic plumber ever. But that's what he, like Reed. And I, I'm not even saying it because he's white. But Reed Shepard yeah. is well, such a 1960s NBA name. That is true. It? Yeah, for, for sure. That's really what You're it right. is. It's a good honorable mention. Um, but and I'm gonna screw up all these names here. Even though right before we went live, I was practicing the well, pronunciation. Can I give you, I'll Go give you a chance to practice. Can I give you the worst name in the draft? Okay. Because I wanted to end with it. I don't want to end, end on a negative note. I wonder. He's not gonna be on your list. AJ Johnson. Really? I like, look, it, it's a nice story. I like that he was in the stands. I have no problem with the player. But AJ Johnson, picked 23 by the Milwaukee Bucks in the first round, feels like such an anonymous name to me. It's so plain and it just feels like such a Milwaukee Bucks pick that they just took. It's, it's a boring name. And I just don't ever see like one of the best players in the league ever being named AJ Johnson. So yeah. that's where I'm at. I, th- I don't know. AJ, every day works. The AJ, I think CJ, those work for me. JJ. Mine, crap, I can't believe I forgot how I should have written this out phonetically as I was just practicing it. But Tijian Salam. <laughs> I screwed this up. Salon, I got for sure right. Tijan Remind Salon. Me of Rich- Tij- Tijan Salon. It might be Tijane. I can't remember. Tijane, Tijane Salon. Salon. Either way, very cool sounding name. Once we get it right, it's going to sound even better. <laughs> it kind of has like it's got the A N sounds in both the first and the last name, which is always great. Um, I think it's a cool one, man. And if he hits, we'll be saying it a lot. Tij for short, man. That is the one hard part about this is what is hey, the t- nickname going to be? Maybe T J. Could you go T J. T J. Salon? That might be just the be, way to you go. Just, you just pick two letters out of his first yeah, name. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it <laughs> number four i'm going with bub carrington hell bub yeah carrington. It sounds more like a golfer if we're being honest bub it bub does. sounds more like a golfer but sounds like a cool uh athlete's name either way i can't believe bub carrington bogeyed the 17th hole and cost himself a chance <laughs> yeah. at the u.s open you know that's oh, what that sounds bub. like classic classic bub. bub uh it's it's similar to it's not his real rent name his real name is carlton carrington so this Don't is why he that. goes this is why he goes by bub but there it's similar go. to Bam Adebayo. His real name is Adris Adebayo, yeah. and he's like, I prefer Bam. So Bam, uh, way better. It, it always works. It always works. Then we have to go to the number one pick, of course, and that is Risache. How great is that to say, Risache? It's fun. It's so fun to say, man. And, and, and his first good. name too is, is Zachary Risache. Zachary, 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 it just Zachary Risache. Those French people, man, they know how to put a name together. I'm gonna go number two here. Could have easily Napoleon been number Bonaparte. one. I think a lot of a lot of people had this number one on the board. Osasere Igodaro. Nailed it. Four or seven syllables. Osasere Igo. No, eight syllables. Osasere Igodaro. I love it, man. That's an incredible name. It so goes he by was Oso. picked by Portland in the second round. Is that right? I can't even remember where he went. Let me pull it up here. I have him. Uh, yep, Portland. 40. Yep. Yep. Number forty. Osasere Igodaro. Yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, I just the think that draft cool. analysis, sorry, is that he is an unconventional big man with an unconventional name. That's so good. I added the second so part. Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> there you go. And then number one, if you're a shooter, what better name to have than Connect, 
Dalton connect. There's so many puns can come out of this one. I what? It's lame. Oh, connected on another three. First pick though. I like Igadaro more. Connect? You don't like connect? It's all right. What a connection out there. Yeah. No, you're right. It's a good one. It's a good I one. I think connect is a great name, man. How do Dalton. you not have Bobby Clinton Clintman with an O? Bobby. Bobby Clintman. I don't know, man. That, that was a good one to me. No make. Dalton Connect. There's no Dalton Connect. That's true. All right. Uh, that will do it for us this week here on the Locked On NBA channel. Thanks for making Locked On NBA your first listen every day. Every day is every day is make sure you're subscribed on YouTube, Odyssey, and wherever it is that you get your podcasts. NBA free agency starts on Sunday. We are still here five days a week covering the NBA and all of the off-season wackiness. So make sure you keep it here. Lockdown NBA, YouTube, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.